Ready for the word this morning? You got your Bible? You got your two-edged sword with you? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, how many can say what a beautiful name it is? Woo! I think we could almost sing that again. What a wonderful name it is. My goodness, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today we are going to deliver part two of a message that we started a couple of weeks ago. And so let's go to the Old Testament book of Ezra here this morning. Ezra chapter 3 is where we will find our opening text. And how many remember the message from a couple weeks ago? Uh, it's, it's never going to be like it was before. Do we remember that? We touched on some things, and hopefully you received something out of that. And so today we're going to deliver part, part two of that message, but I want to go back and read uh, the original text here this morning from Ezra. Ezra chapter 3, verse number 8. And it says, Now in the second month of the second year of their coming uh, to the house of God at Jerusalem, and just real quickly, this is when King Cyrus allowed uh, the nation of Israel to go back to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity. But uh, in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Jer Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, Jeshua, the son of Zodak, and the rest of the brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem began work. How many know ministry is work? How many know God is requiring us to do something that pertains to kingdom work right now? Amen? They began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Joshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel with his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God. How many know there's always something to be done at the house of God? Uh, continues on here, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and the brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, and cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of of Israel. How many know David knew how to worship? I like how it said that here. <laughs> to praise the Lord according to the ordinance, uh, David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout. And when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Now, how many know we, not, we have to get the foundation right? Doesn't matter about all the pomp and circumstance. Doesn't matter about all the hopla, hyper, hoopla up here. We've got to get the foundation right. And how many know who the foundation is today? How many know who the chief cornerstone is? <laughs> oh, there it is. And because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, but many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple. Everybody say the first temple. Old men who had seen the first temple wept, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout. And the sound was heard afar off. Brother Kevin, I'm going to ask that you stand and ask the blessing over the reading of God's Word and that the Holy Spirit would speak to us and through us here today. Brother Kevin, let's pray with him, church. Thank you. Have your way. Anoint our ears to hear. Anoint our hearts to receive, Holy Spirit. Verse number 12, and the church said, 
Amen. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the temple was laid before their eyes, yet many shouted aloud for joy. How many have ever wanted to go back in time? Have you ever wanted to go back to a season in your life? Maybe when you were young, teenager, living at home, courting, less weight, more hair. We all look back at seasons in our lives and there's good times and there's bad times. Isn't it funny how we never want to go back to the bad times? But every once in a while we think, you know, what what would it be like to go back? to the good times, visit the good times. Huh. The title of our message a couple weeks ago was simply this, it's never going to be like it was before. Never going to be like it was before. How many know that we serve a God that he is new and fresh every morning? The Bible tells us that his mercies are new every morning. How many have lived long enough in this good old gospel way to know that you can't live off of yesterday's experience? Some of us who are older here, we have experienced some mighty great things in God. We have seen and witnessed mighty moves of the Holy Spirit. Every once in a while, I want to go back there. I want to see God move like he did in the 80s, in the 90s. I want to see the house of God full again. Come on, somebody. Anybody want to see God move by his power and by his might? (laughs) But I'm here to tell you it's never going to be like it was before. In that message a couple weeks ago, we talked about how our world has changed how many can say amen to that? Amen. Not, not, too, not too much of that changes for the good either. Uh, our world has changed. People have changed. Even the church has changed. But yet through all of the change, God remains the same. God remains the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore the same. Aren't you thankful that God never gets up on the wrong side of the throne? Well, he doesn't sleep or slumber anyway. But how many know God never, never has a bad hair day? He never gets up depressed. He's never discouraged. Come on, somebody. He, his arm is never too weak or too short. But he's a mighty God. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And even though everything around him seems to be changing, he's the same. He's the same. From our opening text here in Ezra, we have found out that King Cyrus has made a decree that Israel could go back to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity. Now, God's people have the chance to return to their homeland, to be restored. It's sad to say So many people, so many of God's people choose to stay in Babylon. It wasn't like the first exodus when probably just about two million people come out of Egyptian bondage. But this time out of Babylon, only a remnant comes. Everybody say a remnant. Only a remnant. It's amazing how we as humans can become so comfortable in sin, addiction, unhealthy lifestyles, dysfunction, and even bondage. That's exactly why so many chose to stay behind in Babylon, simply because their captivity had become comfortable. It had become normal. We've been talking about the new normal here 
over the last several months, and I don't know if the new normal is such a good thing or not, but it, it behooves us to be careful of our surroundings, of our environment, of what we become comfortable with. We talked several weeks ago about uh, Lot and his family, how they became comfortable in Sodom, and ultimately how that cost Lot's wife his very life, her very life. But thank God there was a remnant that came out of Babylon just as there is always a remnant. There is always a remnant. Even here today in 2021 when there's so much compromise and change and complacency, there's still a remnant. Ooh, how many is thankful to be part of the remnant today? The called out ones, the ecclesia. And that remnant, they chose to do not what was easy, but rather to do what was right. To go back to their homeland and to start over. Everybody say start over. How many know sometimes we just need to start over? We just need a clean slate, a fresh start. Come on, somebody. We just need to start over. Look at your neighbor and say, if you need to start over, just go ahead and start over, honey. It's all right. <laughs> and so the remnant goes back to Jerusalem to restore, to rebuild. And as the foundation of temple number two is laid, those who had never seen temple number one began to shout and sing and rejoice and worship. But those who were older who had seen the first temple, they began to weep. They began to weep. Now, I, I emphasize with both sides because sometimes I kind of feel like I'm stuck in the middle. Don't really consider myself to be old school. Don't really consider myself to be new school. You say, well, what are you? I don't know. I don't like school. <laughs> Just telling you, I didn't like school. I'm trying to figure it out still. But I can emphasize with both because I, I, I know what it's like to remember. Come on, somebody. Let's be real here today. I, I, I know what it was like, my God, when the power of God used to fall. I remember when it was easy to have church. I remember when it was easy to have revival. You just, Bishop would just call for a revival. People would just show up. Come on. We'd, like the old song says, we'd open up the hymnal, we'd open up the Bible, and guess what? We'd have revival. And so I see both sides of this story. <laughs> and so the title of our message to hear today is, is something that we've kind of tweaked from a couple weeks ago. The title of our message today is this. It's never going to be like it was before, but it could be better. I said it could be better. In the kingdom of God, how many understand that there is no generation gap? Amen. Or should we say there shouldn't be <laughs> no generation gap? In the kingdom of God, it isn't old school versus new school, or shouldn't be. And the reason why we can say that is because old or young, we are all serving the same God. Can anybody say amen? Amen. I understand we might see things a little different. We might, like, we might want to worship just a little different. Come on, somebody. We might want to dress a little different, but it's the same God. It's the same God. <laughs> We're all serving the same God, and how many understand that God and the message never changes? Never changes. But yet, even though the message never changes... And how many know who the message is? The foundation. <laughs> the, 
The message is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The message is the virgin birth, the blood of, of the Lamb, the cross of Calvary. The message is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The message is that Jesus is the only way. That's the message. That's the message. And even though the message never changes, sometimes the way the message is delivered will change. Even though the message never changed, sometimes the messengers change. Now, sometimes we're good with change and sometimes we're not so good with change. How many's like not good with change? You have a hard time with change. You still have furniture for the 1970s. Don't raise your hand. Sometimes we're good with change. Sometimes we're not so good with change. And before I say what I'm going to say, I realize that not all change is good. I'm not going to stand up here and act like, you know, all change is good. But listen, change means we're alive. Change means we're still growing. Because if we're not changing, guess what? Yeah, we're going downhill and pretty soon there won't be nothing left. Change, growth, is a sign of life. Yeah, I would like to go back to the 165 pound of me. I would like to go back maybe to the way things used to be. But in order for me to live, in order for me to find my way through this whole process, I have to be a part of change. <laughs> but aren't you thankful that we can hold on to that rock who never changes? Sometimes the way the message is delivered will change. Uh how many remember how the old school used to preach hellfire and brimstone? Just about every message was about everything we couldn't do and where we couldn't go. And, and I understand that. And I appreciate that. And I believe in holiness. And, but you know what? I, I also know that there's a generation today who's not scared to do whatever they want to do. And we can stand up here and point our peanut pointy finger at them and tell them, you're going to go to hell if you don't live right. And they'll laugh right back at us. So... So we've got to find out what moves them. We've got to find out where we can make a connection with them. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this tomorrow night uh, down at camp. You know, some we save with love, others we save with fear. The Bible says we are to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Some people you can preach to and they will respond, but some people you got to build a relationship with. You got to let them know that you love them and care about them, and that you're not just up there on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night throwing the mic out. How many know God is not an angry man in heaven? Just waiting for us to mess up, ready to send a lightning bolt every... Boy, I tell you what, if he was, how many know some of us would have been out of luck a long time ago? Including me. But thank God for grace. And thank God for growth. And thank God that we can learn how to deliver this gospel. Do we dare say what worked 40 or 50 years ago might not work today? Or the delivery that we had 40 or 50 years ago? <laughs> How many are still with me this morning? God never changes, but our methods change, the times change, people change. Have you, heard, have you ever heard somebody say, uh, catch up with the times? 
Sometimes we get stuck, don't we? Sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes we get in a rut. How many have ever been in a rut before? Or what did our bishop always used to say? He said a rut was just no more than a grave with both ends kicked out. We're in that rut. But we're comfortable with it because that's where we've been for a long time. Guess what? Israel was comfortable in Babylon. Many of them didn't go back to their homeland. Change. Everybody say change. Now, granted, I realize we all have likes and dislikes, right? We all have our preferences. Um, we all have our preferences for the way we think the gospel should be delivered, the methods in which we do that, our worship style, a, a preference even in the songs we sing, so on and so forth. But how many understand as believers in Christ, there should be one thing that binds us all together, and his name is how many know if we can't rally around the cross, if we can't ra rally around the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, then something's wrong. Something's wrong. And I think this is one of the greatest weapons of the enemy in the day and age in which we live is to divide the church. I hate to say this, but Sunday is one of the most segregated days of all the week. Not just by race, but by age, likes, dislikes. <laughs> but there's one thing that should bind us together, and his name is Jesus. You've heard me say this many a times. I love doctrine. We preach doctrine here. We teach doctrine every Wednesday night. But doctrine divides us. But Jesus unites us. Jesus unites us. Does that mean we throw doctrine out the window? Absolutely not. But listen, we don't sit here. We don't fight about it. We don't get an attitude about it. Come on, somebody. We agree to disagree. We rally around the cross. We rally around the, around the cross. Now, I realize we're not all going to see things eye to eye. How many understand your spouse? You and your spouse don't see everything eye to eye. There's always going to be differences in the body of Christ. But can I tell you, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Our diversity should not be our weakness. It should be our strength. But there's always going to be differences in our churches. There's always going to be differences even in the body of Christ. There's always going to be differences in our styles of worship and our pre preferences and our dress and so on and so forth. There's going to be differences in the way we deliver the gospel, the way we preach, the way we approach, the way we minister. You have some churches that are very youth-oriented or emphasize the young adults and everything's geared toward that younger generation. And their style tends to be more contemporary, upbeat and loud and this and that and more programs and the such. And then you have some churches that are more diverse and traditional in their approach. How many know it takes all? It takes all. What did, Paul, did Paul say I became all things to? Yeah, that I might win some. Here at Full Gospel, even though we try to be diverse, we really tend to be more fundamental and conservative. And so what happens in that is people choose where they want to be. They choose where they are comfortable. And yes, sometimes that falls along generational lines. But yet our diversity, no matter what it is, if it's songs, worship styles, age, race, gender, it doesn't matter because nothing should divide us as children of God. Nothing should divide us as the body of Christ. How many understand if this piece is over there and this piece is over there and this piece is back here, how many know we're not a body? But we're jointly fitted together. 
Every member, every joint supplies, right? Nothing should divide us. Are we going to agree in everything? Are we going to see everything just the same? Is Pastor Josh going to sing our favorite song every week? No, he's not. And guess what? I'm not going to preach his favorite sermon every week either. But you got to love me anyhow. Come on, you got to get in here and help me anyhow. And I got to help you. Listen, you're not going to wear my favorite dress every week. And all the men said, Amen. <laughs> You see, as born-again, spirit-filled believers, we have an obligation. We have a responsibility. Not to do what is right for me. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you, us. We have a right. Or, or, or we have an obligation. We have a responsibility not to necessarily do what's right for me, but to do what's right for the whole. You see, even as pastor, there are some things here that I, if I had my personal preference, I would tweak them a little bit. But you know what? I let people be people. I let people be who God has called them to be. I let our ministers and our praise team and our, I, I let our uh, ministry teams and, you know, the youth and the, and the, the kids, I let them do what God has called them to do. I don't believe that I need to be some hounding, controlling, manipulating. That's witchcraft. How many know we don't need a bunch of Steves running around, but we need the body jointly fitted together? Somebody say, thank God we ain't got a bunch of Steves running around. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. That's enough to shout about right there. Diversity. Everybody say diversity. Now, I understand it. I get it. Really, I do. Because I, I am a little bit from the old school. And, I want, and when I see some things, mm, kind of digs me a little bit. But we've got to understand, especially where this younger generation is coming from. Let's just start with tattoos. Tattoos don't mean what they used to mean years ago. They're just an expression of who people are. Clothing. You know, we all dressed up in suits and ties years ago. We all did this. We all did that. We all looked alike. How many know God doesn't want cookie-cutter cookie cutter religion where we all look the same, where we all talk the same Christianese? Because, you know, one thing I learned about religion is you can look real pretty on Sunday morning but act like the devil Monday through Saturday. So that's one of the things I don't want to go back to. We're talking about growth. We're talking about diversity. We're talking about giving people space and let them exercise their gifts, their calling. What does the Bible say? Your gift will make room for you. Does Pastor Josh sing my favorite song every week? No, he does. But you know what? I don't tell him what to sing. That's between him and the Lord. Look at your neighbor and tell them, just stay in your lane. If there's a problem, pray into it. Right? If there's something you don't like, listen, God might be trying to get the flesh out of you. You know, the ball caps. Us old school, we all, oh man, if you wear a ball cap inside the building, you know, it's disrespectful. Well, to you it might be. But to them, they're just being, are, are we going to let somebody go to hell over a ball cap? Over a tattoo? Over not having a suit and tie on? What's more important, how people look or the condition of their heart? What does the Bible say? Man looks on the, but God looks I'm going to know some of them old-time Pentecostal ladies with their hair up and their dresses down could be some of the most meanest, hateful, degrading, looking down their nose at you, better than, I'm better than you. Holiness isn't something we put on on Sunday and take off on Monday. 
Holiness is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle. Do we have preferences? Yeah. Let's take it to another level. Do we have convictions? Yeah. Oh, I hope you do. In fact, if you don't have personal convictions, you're probably not saved. But listen, if you don't have Bible for it, then we don't get up here and preach it as thus saith the Lord. It's just a personal conviction. But keep this in mind, just like they found out in the early, in the, in the, uh, yeah, in the early church in the New Testament, don't cause your brother to stumble either. Don't let your liberties call your, your brothers and sisters in Christ to stumble. <laughs> How many know we got to use wisdom? There it goes back to wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. <laughs> How many understand that as born-again, spirit-filled believers, we all have responsibility to lead the next generation? The one following us. The one coming up behind us. Look at this in Psalms 145, 4. It says, one generation shall praise your works to another. In other words, my generation has got to show the next generation, right? One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Who's going to tell our children about Jesus? Who's going to tell our grandchildren about the great things God has done for us? We are. Everybody say, we are. are. Mom and dad, can I tell you that it's our responsibility as parents. It's our responsibility as parents to teach our children and our grandchildren. Not the Sunday school teacher. Not the youth pastor. It's our responsibility. (laughs) Look what the prophet Isaiah said here in Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah 38, 19, it says, The living... The living man, he shall praise you. As I do this day, the Father shall make known your truth to the children. To the children. I don't know who it was. Sister Donna, was it? I think it might have been Sister Donna. Somebody sent me this week where an all-male course from San Francisco was singing, and they were singing about this song, How They Were Coming for Our Children. Gay men. Did anybody see that? I should have, I didn't think about that. I should have pulled that up and they should, no, nah, we ain't even playing that in the house of God. Let me rethink that. No, we ain't even playing that. But just take my word for it. I'll show it for you. I'll show it to you individually if you want to see it. An all male chorus from San Francisco, gay men singing how they're coming for our children. So guess what? If we don't teach our children, the world will. (laughs) It's not going to be right, I promise you, if the world does it. The spiritual condition of our children, our grandchildren, and the next generation is our responsibility. Everybody say, it's my responsibility. You say, well, Steve, I don't have no children. I don't have no grandchildren. You know what? Then get some spiritual sons and daughters. Start mentoring some young people. Go to youth camp with us. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Look at this in Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6. Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child. Everybody say, train up a child. In other words, just don't teach them. Just don't show them, but train them. Mm. How many understand training takes time? Have you ever trained something? Training takes energy. Training takes purpose. Training takes takes repetition. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Anybody ever trained a pet or an animal? You start when they're very young, very little. And the reason why you do that is because you don't want them getting bad habits. You don't want them getting in that rut we were talking about. (laughs) When you're training something, the trainer has to be fair, firm, and consistent. The trainer needs to be present in the life of that animal or whatever's being trained all the time. Because guess what? When the trainer leaves, 
The pet's going to do whatever he wants to. But today is, today the problem is we need to train the trainers. I don't know who the trainers are anymore. What was that scripture? It said, you know, by now you should be teaching yourself, you should be preaching yourself, but we're having to teach you again. Look at your neighbor and say, you should be teaching this. <laughs> Training. Not just teaching, not just instructing, but training. Investing some time, some effort, some energy. How many know it takes patience to be a trainer? Got to exercise some patience when you're training something. As trainers, we need to be trained. But then once we instill these godly values into our children, and how many know we can expect some good things to happen? Now, it might not be overnight. They might have to go sow their, sow their wild oats for a while, but how many know if it really got in there? God is a man of his own word. Come on, somebody. God's not a man that he should lie. But if we train up a child in the way they go, when they're old, they will not depart from it. It might not look like the first temple, but who knows? When it's all said and done, it might turn out better. Hello? It might just turn out better. <laughs> How many's believe in God for something? You believe in for God to do something in your life, in the life of your family? How many's ever got a word or a promise from God that hasn't come past yet? Don't give up on it. But you know what the devil wants us to do? The devil wants us to give up hope. Oh, you didn't hear from God. You're never going to do your ministry. Come on, somebody. You're never going to go to the mission field. You're never going to be an evangelist. You're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. How many know the devil is a liar? How about this? You're never going to get over that sin. You're never going to get out of that addiction. You're never going to get delivered. How many know the devil is a liar? Look at this, Haggai, chapter 2, verse number 6. It says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more it is a little while. How many know it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was here? So it's been a little while. I will shake heaven and earth and the sea and dry land. Anybody see the 6.0 earthquake out in California, Nevada there? Boulders come falling, crashing down off the mountainside. Did you see that? Oh, so many things happening in our world right now. I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. For the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the... Oh, wait a minute. How's that possible? The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. How many know when God says it, we don't have to try to perform it. We just got to be faithful and sometimes just sit back and let God be God. Look at your neighbor and tell him, just, just let God do his thing. I promise you, if we're faithful... To what we know to do, God will be more than faithful to what he's supposed to do. Amen? <laughs> but notice here how the latter temple is the one that comes after the former one. And what did the Apostle Paul say about the last one of something? Let's look at it here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 52 Paul said this to the church at Corinth. He said, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last what? King James says, at the last trump. Fill in the blanks. At the last trump. <laughs> 
You see, I think if we look closely at the scriptures, we'll see a pattern of how God saves the best for last. How many know the first Adam messed us up? But how many know the second Adam redeemed us? Man got us into this mess, but thank God the man, Jesus Christ, got us out of this mess. <laughs> Woo! Quickly, how about Jesus' first miracle? Let's look at that real quick. St. John chapter 2, verse number 1. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, somebody say, Whoops! You ever had company and run out of something? All right. <laughs> and when they had ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now this shows the human side of Jesus here because he kind of almost had an attitude with his own mother. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, Whatsoever he says to you, do it. How many know Jesus' little attitude right there didn't mess up Mary at all? <laughs> didn't discourage her one little bit. She just said, hey, listen, whatever he says to do, do it. Oh, my Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Now, there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior stuff comes out. In other words, the cheap stuff comes out. But you have kept the good wine until now. Woo! Look at your neighbor and tell him, you better stick around, honey. You better, stick, you better stick around. You better keep your fork because the best is... Woo! How many know dessert's on its way? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Jesus said, save the best wine for last. Mm. You see, at the bare minimum, God will at least restore us. He will at least restore to us what, we've, what we had before, but most of the time, it's always better than it was before. Why? Because that's the kind of God we serve. He's the God of more than enough. In fact, sometimes I think he likes to show off a little bit. Come on, somebody. How about Job, for example? Anybody remember the story of Job? A rich, upright man. But yet he lost everything. But look at this. Job chapter 42, verse 10, to make a real long story short. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave him how much? The Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. Somebody's missing a good place to shout right now. Look at your neighbor and tell him I'm getting double for my trouble. I'm getting double for my trouble. <laughs> Let's go to Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse number 25. The word of the Lord comes through the prophet Joel and says, So I will restore to you the years. Ooh, everybody say the years. How many's had some time that you need restored to you? Some health, some energy, some money. <laughs> so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, and every other kind of lowest locust you can think of. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. 
then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. How many know we're not Israel, but how many know we are spiritual Israel? (laughs) I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. (laughs) I don't know how you think about how all this is going to shake out. I really don't know either. I have my thoughts. But I tell you what, as the world continues to get worse, and worse and worse. And how many of that's the Bible? Gross darkness, the people. I believe the church is going to be taken care of through all that mess. And if we do have to stick around for the tribulation, guess what? God will bring us through that as well. We have a win-win God. Does anybody... You can't go wrong with Jesus. We shall never be put to shame. Think about when this Gentile age comes to a close. God's heart is going to be turned back to the Jewish people. And those who have rejected Jesus, God is going to show them mercy one more time. And that's why we've got to be so careful. I understand God is a God of judgment. I understand there's a line we can cross. But I tell you what, it would surprise us the grace and the mercy and the love and the faithfulness of our God. If you don't believe me, just look at an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. God will go out of his way to save mankind. Mm, 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 mm. (laughs) <laughs> what does the Bible say? It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. <laughs> How many want and need restoration in your life? How many has the devil that he stole from you at some time or another? Let's take it to another level. How many at some point in time in your life has just willingly give stuff, stuff up? made your own mistakes, and yeah. Either way, we serve a God of restoration. Either way. Somebody say either way. Listen, don't live in in condemnation about how you used to live. We've all made mistakes. We've all chose our beds and had to lie in them. Come on, somebody. (laughs) But God is a God of restoration. How many know His love, His grace, His mercy, His faithfulness isn't contingent upon our goodness his goodness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Amen. Look at this. Proverbs 6.31. I'm closing this up. The thief, when he is found, he must restore how much? Sevenfold. Not just double this time, but this time it's sevenfold. In fact, he may have to give up all the substance of his house. <laughs> In other words, if you've been faithful, not saying perfect, Because none of us are. But if you've been faithful in doing what is right, then guess what? God is going to bless you, and he's going to make the devil pay for it. Amen? I said he's going to bless you, not only in the presence of your enemies. Come on. He's going to make the devil pay for it. How many know he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies? Oh, sure, things may never be the same again, but they could be better. They could be better. God could wrap this thing up. It could come full circle. The church could be completely restored. And I'm not talking about the church as a whole. I'm talking about the remnant church. The the ones that chose to go back and do the hard work and lay the foundation. Come on, somebody. The ones that chose to do what they should have been doing while the others stayed back in Babylonian captivity. My last scripture, praise team, you can come. Acts chapter 3. 
I believe God saves the best for last. Wow. And how many know we're the last day's church? Woo Figure that one out. Acts chapter 3, verse number 19. Now this is a formula. Like so many other formulas in the Bible. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. So on and so forth. This is a formula. How many want God's best? How many want restoration? How many want the glory of God restored in the house of God? Come on, somebody. How many want to see some things happen before we get out of here? Here's the formula. Repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of what? Oh, there it is. Refreshing. Revival. Renewal. Restoration. Come on, somebody. <laughs> that the times of refreshing may come. And how do they come? They don't come from our programs. They don't come from all this other stuff. Those refreshing times come from the presence of the Lord. Oh, Jesus. And that he may send Jesus, Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until, or in other words, heaven must hold on to until the times of restoration of how many things? Not just some, not just most, but the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Woo! How many believe we serve a God of restoration? All we have to do is our part. All we have to do is our part. But now, here's the trick of the enemy right now. The devil plays mind games with us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The devil will play mind games with us because the devil wants us to think that our best days are Exactly. Exactly. And this is especially tough for some of us older folks who have lived the majority of our lives. And the devil will play those mind games and say, you know what? It's never going to be like it was before. Your best days are behind you. But how many know, like Pastor Tom says, every time the devil speaks, he's lying. You see, the devil wants us to give up hope. How many have ever been in a seemingly hopeless situation? How many know that's an ugly place to be? But how many know if God steps into the picture, there's all kind of hope, honey? Somebody say, we just need God to show up. But you see, the devil wants us to think that all hope is lost. That diagnosis you got from the doctor? Come on, somebody. Those bills that will never come, stop coming? Come on. Those children who are away from God? The devil wants to think, hey, yeah, nothing's ever going to change. I don't know why you're going to church. I don't know why you're being faithful. I don't know why you're reading your Bible. You're just wasting your time. We got any real humans in this place today? The devil ever lie to you? Man, I'm telling you. Let me say this. The devil is not only a liar. The devil is already defeated. Woo, I just think we missed a good place to shout right there. I said not only is the devil a liar. But he's already defeated. I wish somebody get on their feet and begin to thank God and worship God that your healing is coming. Your breakthrough is coming. Salvation is coming to your house. It may not be like it was before, but it can even be better. Woo, Jesus. 
I'm not wanting to go back. I'm wanting to go forward. I press towards the mark. See, the devil just hopes. Every day we get up, you know what the devil's hoping? Here's what he's wanting us to do. He's wanting us to get up and see our situation and see our circumstance. And you know what he's wanting to do? He's wanting us to do this. Throw in the towel. He's wanting us to give up. But I tell you what, I'm kind of stubborn. Anybody stubborn here? I said, I've come too far to turn back now. I haven't come this far to only come this far. In fact, the more the devil tells me I can, the more me and Jesus are going to prove him wrong. I don't know who this message is for, but it's for you. You need to get in this altar right now. Come on. And we're going to worship God. We're going to pray. Jesus. Ha ha ha.